Hi, my name is Brian, and I'm the pastor of Vision at Holy City Church. I'm glad that you found our online sermon resources, and I pray that the Lord would use them to strengthen your faith. I would exhort you not to use our online sermon resources as a substitute for regular involvement in your own local church. That being said, I pray that our teaching resources would be helpful to you and conform you even more to the image of Christ. Hebrews chapter 4, verses 14 through 16. Since then, we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of, Christ, of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Uh, there are times when your need for an advocate or a representative, someone to come in and speak for you, stand for you, is, is clear. Uh, after the first several weeks of the COVID chaos in 2020, I was on a Zoom call with other Charleston Baptist Association pastors as we spoke with Governor McMaster and Senator Tim Scott expressing our desires in those early days, uh, wanting to balance, we want to love our neighbor, we want to submit, rightly submit to the government, but we also want to obey the Lord and, and love the saints and regularly gathering together for corporate worship. Uh, both of these political leaders are professing Christians, they, they heard our petitions, and they helped to guide our association and our local church through that complex period. Uh, within a few weeks, many Charleston Baptist Association churches were gathering in person again for corporate worship. And in late 2020, Holy City Church received an unexpected $22,000 property tax bill. Many of you will remember that from Charleston County. And our nonprofit exemption request to the South Carolina Department of Revenue was partially denied. So we hired multiple attorneys to represent us before the state tax agency. And over the course of, of the year, our local attorneys not only understood the complexities of our particular situation, but they all, also successfully protested the property tax bill and secured our full property tax exemption as a South Carolina nonprofit. And their, their representation, their advocacy over the past four years has saved our local church nearly $100,000. Having advocates in authoritative positions of government have, have been particularly helpful for, for my own family this year. Uh, some of you are aware the Internal Revenue Service has held indefinitely our family's large 2023 tax return. Uh, the IRS is holding our return to verify our income. They don't need any more additional in info from us. They just want us to wait. We're not being audited or anything like that, just randomly. They've been telling us this since early February. Just wait. We've been waiting for about 100 days. Thus far, last week, I was told by an IRS agent that it'll likely be early August before I can call back and get an update. But I had already reached out to the offices of Congresswoman Nancy Mace, our representative, and Senator Tim Scott, requesting their intervention and advocacy. And this weekend, Representative Mace's office gave me an update stating that they were able to connect with the Taxpayer Advocacy Service, an independent organization within the IRS, uh, whose job it is to advocate for taxpayers and to ensure each taxpayer is treated fairly. The TAS reviewed my case. They said my income is verifiable. Everything looks great on their end, and so they've requested that the uh, Income Verification Department release our tax refund as soon as possible. It's good to have a person in authority who speaks for you and advocates on your behalf before a ruler or before a government in a, in a difficult situation, particularly in the midst of hardship. In Hebrews 4, 14 to 16, the author teaches us saints how wonderful it is to have Jesus Christ 
speaking for and advocating on our behalf before God's throne as we experience hardship. We must remember that we have an advocate, a high priest, a representative in heaven before God who speaks and acts for us right now. In this particular section, the author grounds his his two exhortations for us. Let us hold fast the confession. Let us approach the throne of grace with confidence. He grounds these two exhortations for us in this fact. Jesus is our great, merciful high priest. And he sympathizes with us. So this week we're going to look at the first exhortation from the author of Hebrews. So only one point, we'll, we'll be looking at the two groundings for his, for his exhortation. But we're just going to be looking at verse 14. Uh, hold fast to our confession. The exhortation in verse 14 we're going to look at. Hold fast to our confession. That's the charge this morning from the author of Hebrews. In our context, again, just briefly, author of Hebrews is writing to Hebrew Christians in Rome, more than likely. These Christians, formerly Jews, they're suffering for the sake of their faith in Jesus. And so they are strongly tempted to turn back to Judaism, turn back to the Old Covenant, turn back to the Mosaic Law in order to escape suffering for Jesus. And the author of Hebrews has spent four chapters now teaching us all how the Son of God, Jesus Christ, is superior in every way to everything that has come before Him. He is supreme in prophetic revelation. He is supreme in kingship. He is the creator, and he is greater than his created angels. He's greater than Moses. He is greater than Joshua. He is the fulfillment of the Edemic, Abrahamic, and Davidic promises that he unpacks in Hebrews 1 and 2. He is the fulfillment of Old Testament hopes and expectations. He is the son over God's house. He alone is the one through whom God's promised rest and promised land, the new creation, are enjoyed. And in this short section, he is supreme as high priest before God. Since the Son of God, Jesus Christ, is better in every way, since his new covenant far outstrips and outdoes the old covenant, we must hold fast to him. All of the various arguments that the author of Hebrews systematically unpacks from his exposition of the Old Testament are intended to exhort and encourage Christians to persevere in the faith, to hold steadfastly to Christ, to not fall away from our Savior. Our section this morning, Hebrews 4, 14 to 16, is a hinge section. He is beginning to transition to a new topic, specifically the priesthood of Christ, that's going to expand from Hebrews 5 all the way through Hebrews 10. He continues to examine the Old Covenant shortcomings. He's going to argue for the superiority of the New Covenant. But he's going to hone in on the priestly work of Christ. And that priestly work of Christ is completely relevant to our endurance in the faith. Christ's work as our great high priest is going to stretch roughly six chapters. No other New Testament book or author will write as much or as explicitly about the priestly work of Christ than the author of Hebrews, from this section all the way to the end of Hebrews 10. In fact, what we likely have in Hebrews 4, 14 to 16 is the first bookend or the first part of an inclusio, a a, a rhetorical sandwich that will end in the second bookend of Hebrews 10, 19 to 25. Let's just read both sections. 
Hebrews 4, 14 to 16. Since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. And then from everything on, priesthood of Christ, priestly work of Christ, atonement of Christ, sacrifice of Christ, Hebrews 10, 19 to 25. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us, through the curtain, that is, through his flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stir one another up to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. So these two sections communicate nearly identical truths, and then this huge chunk, a third of the book, more than a third of the book of Hebrews, is going to expound on this main point that we are beginning to touch on in this hinge section this morning. Jesus Christ is the supreme high priest and perfect sacrifice that we need to enjoy reconciliation with and redemption from God. So let's look at his first exhortation. Hold fast to our confession. Our in our sh- Short section this morning, the author gives us, for you grammar nerds, two hortatory subjunctives. What in the world does that mean? They're essentially two imperative-like exhortations or commands, exhorting us to respond and live in such a way because Jesus is our high priest. So, in other words, the author's two exhortations are both built upon the same foundation, the foundation of Jesus' priestly work on our behalf. Now, like I mentioned, we'll we'll tackle the second exhortation next week, the throne of grace, approaching it boldly. This morning, we'll look at the first command. Let us hold fast our confession. Now, this is not a new command. This is not a new exhortation from the author of Hebrews. The author of Hebrews has been giving a form of this command throughout the first four chapters of his letter, but the exhortation to endure thus far has been largely couched in the form of strong warnings. Look at Hebrews 2, 1 to 3. We must pay much closer attention to the gospel because how shall we escape If we neglect a new covenant salvation so much greater than the just and retributive old covenant. Warning. Don't fall away. Hebrews 3.6. We are his house. If indeed we hold fast our confidence in the hope in which we boast. Warning. Hold fast to Jesus in order to be God's house. Hebrews 3, 12 to 14. Take care, brothers, lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart leading you to fall away from the living God, but exhort one another every day, as long as it is called today, that, one, that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. For we have come to share in Christ, if indeed we hold our original confidence firm to the end. Warning, don't harden your hearts as Israel did in the rebellion at Meribah. Hebrews 4.1, therefore, while the promise of entering his rest still stands, let us fear, lest any of you should seem to have failed to reach it. Warning, don't fail to enter God's rest as the wilderness generation of Israel failed. Be fearful of falling away. Hebrews 4.11, work hard for the Lord now so that you might enter God's rest on the last day, knowing 
that God's word strips away all falsehoods, lays bare all of our works for what they actually are on that final day of judgment. Warning, strive to enter God's rest by faith because God's word will expose every form of unbelief. And you may look like you believe, but if, if your life is patterned by unbelief, the Lord will strip it away on the last day. His word will pierce through and discern what is true. Strive to enter that rest. The author has repeatedly used strong language, frank warnings, uncomfortable language to remind these Christians, again, Christians who are suffering intensely for the sake of Christ. Strong language, strong warnings to keep these Christians from falling away from Christ. Reminding them that falling away from Jesus has inexplicably terrible consequences and must be avoided at all costs. There's no more important thing in this world than holding fast to Christ. So, we, we see, I mean, this, this, the, the letter of Hebrews is a sermon. Okay, it's written to be given as a sermon. So we see that there's a good and a necessary place in Christian preaching, in Christian discipleship, exhortation, counseling, rebukes, and corrections for this kind of loving, strong warning. You must hold fast. Do not fall away. Strive to enter God's rest. You must fear God and let that Godly fear cause you to endure. Asking the question, are you in God's house? Live in such a way that the genuineness of your faith is revealed through your good works. Enter God's rest in Christ. You have entered God's rest in Christ. Amen. But you better keep working. You better keep working because God rested after he finished his work and you will rest after you finish yours. Don't get lazy. Don't get complacent. Don't fall away. You must strive, labor, work with all of your might, all of the power that the Lord supplies by his spirit to enter that final rest. Don't stop laboring for Christ. Don't fall away. Hold fast repeated strong commands with a bite it's been four chapters of it but the author of Hebrews is the uh, consummate pastor and preacher I mean he's so rhetorically gifted clearly knows how to interpret and apply the Old Testament and see its fulfillment in Christ but but he's also a faithful shepherd. And he knows that a sermon with only heat will scorch the harvest. Only heat and and you might and you might kill when when you're trying to encourage healthy growth. So, so gospel preaching, in a way, must be a controlled burn. You've got to have some fire passing through the forest. It's got it's to scorch up and destroy and kill all of that parasitic vegetation that's sucking nutrients, sucking life away from the good plants and the trees. So you've got to have, a, you gotta have a controlled burn, a fire that passes through burns up all of the waste so that the trees and the plants that are intended to be there can grow stronger and larger. And, and this author has been spitting fire up to this point with these strong warnings, but, but now he provides a gentle balm. 
He grounds his exhortation to the saints to endure in glorious gospel realities like Christ's effectual and his merciful intercession as our high priest. Let us hold fast to our confession. He, he includes himself in it. Hey, you got to hold fast. And he says, we've got to hold fast. We've got to hold fast to our confession. And in this exhortation, the author gives us the why we endure, the, the how we hold fast. Let us hold fast to our confession. Since we have such a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. But that's not just it. That, that's one reason. That's one grounding. And for or because we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Two reasons, two grounds for why we must hold fast Hold fast, and we're going to give our attention to this first exhortation. So first, we must hold fast our confession since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. We can and we must hold fast beloved, because Jesus is our great priest who has passed through the heavens. But, but before we get there, we've got to answer the question because there's a, there's a variety of saints in here. There are a variety of people, unbelievers and believers in here. We've got to ask the question, what, what is a high priest? Why do we need one? When we think about a priest, we might think about a Roman Catholic priest or an Anglican priest. Or maybe you have a background uh, Hindu priest or what have you. In order to understand, the author of Hebrews speaking about a high priest, you must first understand, like foundationally, that you don't approach God on your terms. The fact that there is a priesthood at all means that you don't get to approach God on your terms. And that is counterintuitive, countercultural in our day and age. I mean, it's always been that way. The perfectly holy, just, loving, transcendent, incomparably glorious, incomprehensibly great God of all creation is not approached on anyone's terms except His own. I mean, he is so transcendent and infinitely above us that we couldn't approach him if we wanted to. And we intuitively understand this point that, like, we can't come to him on our terms. We can't come to him when we want to. We can't come to him how we want to and for the reasons that we want to. Because each of us understands that you can't approach anyone with great authority or prestige on your own terms. Like you can't approach the President of the United States on your own terms because if you try, you'll likely get tackled and arrested by the Secret Service. Right? We, we can see the barrier of Secret Service agents that are following the President wherever he's going, surrounding him. We see these, this long entourage of vehicles wherever he's going. We see this barrier. We understand that if, if, if I'm going to talk to the President, if I'm going to have an audience with him, I have to be invited by him. I can't just go up and say, I got, a, I got a problem with you, as if he's going to hear me. But for some, like, we understand that, but for some reason, we're all born believing that we'll be able to approach, be able to approach the God of all creation on our terms. Well, God will forgive me because I'm a good guy. Oh, it's on your terms. Your definition of good. I, I got you. The author of Hebrews will tell us a little later that our God is a consuming fire, uh, which is a problem for all of us who can be burned. Uh, 
And it's really a problem for us, for his creatures who have disobeyed and morally rebelled against him, which we've all done. God doesn't accept people, his image bearers, into his his presence to enjoy his rest because you're pretty good compared to your co-worker. Or because you've lived, by and large, a morally upstanding life in your own eyes. Or even people have been like, man, you're, you're so good. Such a great person. No, you enter into God's presence when he invites you. And when you share in God's moral perfection and righteousness. And as I look out, none of you have that on your own. And not only that, but because of our sin and our disobedience and our rebellion against God, not only have we not merited an invitation from Him, we've merited His his eternal wrath. His just, holy, loving wrath against sin. But here's the thing. God did not leave His people to their own devices. Throughout the Old Testament, God raised up particular people who would serve in a particular office called the priesthood. So that God's people could enjoy His covenant presence. And in Israel, the Levites were the tribe of Israel that served as priests for the people of Israel. You know, if you were in Judah, it's like, uh, you can't be a priest in the Old Covenant. If you were uh, anyone other than a Levite, tribe of Dan, like, sorry, can't be a priest. God appointed the Levites, and it was through the work of Israel's Levitical priesthood that Israel could relate to God at all. The the Levite priest could could approach God in the tabernacle, which was the mobile tent, moving around all in the wilderness, and into the land. And then later, Solomon built the Jerusalem temple according to God's instructions. And the Levites would operate in the tabernacle and then later in the temple so that individual Israelites and or the entire nation could receive forgiveness for their sins. The priest would offer various sacrifices depending on the situation. And it was the blood of these sacrifices that covered over the people's sin and purchased a temporary reprieve of sorts. Because you had to keep offering sacrifices. It wasn't a once for all. And then the people could enjoy God's presence through this old covenant institution because they were obeying God's command to deal with their sins on His terms. Sin, moral rebellion against God, demands cursing and death from God. And the Levitical sacrificial system provided a way by which the people themselves wouldn't have to be cursed and die. It provided a way by which people could offer specific animals... As substitutes. And the high priest would put his hand on the head of that goat or that lamb or what have you. Identifying with that particular substitute. And those animals would be cursed and killed in the place of the people. Once a year on the Day of Atonement, the high priest alone would enter into the most holy place. You couldn't be a priest unless you were a Levite. And you couldn't enter into the Holy of Holies to enjoy God's particular covenant presence in the holiest part of the tabernacle and the, and the temple unless you were the high priest. There were barriers that separated people from the presence of the Lord. And this high priest alone would enter on, into this most holy place once a year And he would sprinkle the blood of the innocent goat on the mercy seat of the Ark of the Covenant. And the judgment of death and the shedding of blood sprinkled upon the mercy seat would be the means by which God's mercy was then released upon all the people. Mercy was released when blood was shed. Now, there were God-intended problems with this, this particular sacrificial system. It was intended to be insufficient and weak. It was meant to point beyond itself, 
to something far greater. And the author of Hebrews is telling us how to understand it. But for our purposes this morning, we must understand that approaching God, enjoying His holy presence without you being destroyed requires a God-appointed high priest who would represent you, intercede for you, offer an unblemished, perfect sacrifice in your place in order that your sins might be forgiven, in order that you would not experience God's judgment and His wrath. And only when your sins were atoned for according to God's prescribed means were you able to enjoy God's presence. And only the high priest was able to walk into God's presence, the Holy of Holies. Anyone else who walked in there, they were struck dead. Priestly intercession was necessary for a good relationship to exist between a sinful people and a holy God. We saw this last week with Pastor Drew taking us through the very end of Job. Job's friends can't approach God on their own terms. They can't even ask for forgiveness and the Lord listen to them. What does the Lord tell them? I'll listen to Job. I'll tell Job how to intercede for you, and then I'll hear his prayers, I'll receive his sacrifices, then I'll forgive you. You don't approach God, you don't get forgiveness from God on your terms, but on God's terms. In Exodus 19, God commands Moses to come up to Mount Sinai for the giving of the Old Covenant law. And God tells Moses that if anybody, anything, including an animal, touches this mountain, it's dead. You don't approach God on your terms. That's always been the case. The priests also guarded the holiness of God before the people and ensured proper worship. In Exodus 32, Israel makes a golden calf. You know, Aaron says he throws some gold in and this, this calf pops out, right? The worst excuse in redemptive history. Uh, they, they make this golden calf, right? And, and what does Aaron say? This is the God who saved you from Egypt. This, this is Yahweh over here. This is one we can control. Moses comes down, breaks the tablets. They've already broken the law. Moses says, who's with the Lord? The Levites stand up. They zealously stand up. They strap swords to their sides. They execute God's judgment by striking down 3,000 idolatrous Israelites. And as a result, God makes the Levites the priests for the nation. You don't worship God on your terms. The priestly office is good and necessary for God's people to have a covenant relationship with Him. And when we think about priesthood in the New Testament, when the author of Hebrews says, Jesus is our great high priest, we we, we can't think about something other than Old Testament Levitical priesthood. That is the context in which Jesus came. He submitted Himself to that covenant perfectly, and He came in that mold. But He's greater author of Hebrews is going to teach us how. So the author of Hebrews writes, we must endure, we must hold fast, because we have a great and unsurpassed high priest in Jesus, the Son of God. I mean, what glorious good news this morning. If you're walking in here and you're feeling the weight of your sin... Like, what good news it is to know I am accepted because I've got a great high priest who has passed through the heavens. Brian's not my high priest. Drew's not my high priest. There is no other high priest who can stand for me but Jesus alone. I I want you to meditate just for a moment On this point, at this moment, before God's throne, Jesus speaks for you. 
Like as you're just sitting there, you may or may not have had a good morning. You don't know what you're going to do this afternoon. You're just trying to stay focused on this guy who preaches way too long. You don't understand everything about the priesthood, but man, you feel the weight of your sin. And here's the reality. Jesus is speaking for you specifically. When we know that, how could we not hold fast? What, what other high priest could do for us what Jesus does? What an incredible privilege we enjoy, saints. We have God's favor and we have God's ear always because of Jesus. Look at how the author describes our high priest. Jesus, the Son of God, just in case you weren't you weren't aware of it, right? He's been talking about the Son a lot, and then he's occasionally sprinkled in Jesus, and now he's combined. Yes, Jesus is the Son of God. He's not just the Son of God. He is the one who has passed through the heavens, okay? The incarnate Son of God himself is our high priest. He alone has passed through the heavens in order to save us and speak for us. The Son of God passed through the heavens the first time in coming down to be born and to live and to die on our behalf. And the Son of God has passed through the heavens the second time is our risen and reigning high priest who alone may stand before God and speak on our behalf. We see that the Son of God is utterly transcendent and infinitely high above us because of where He came from. He alone passed through the heavens in order to rescue and redeem us. The Son's origin is heaven itself. And then He he passed through space-time, passed into our atmosphere, boom, born in Bethlehem. And then He went back the other direction to intercede for us. At the right time, this indescribably great Son of God stepped down from heaven voluntarily according to God's plan, the triune God's plan of redemption from all of eternity. He stepped down from heaven. He stepped into creation. He passed through space and into our world. He condescended to us by taking upon himself a true and full human nature in the incarnation. He lived a perfect life of obedience. He died obediently under God's wrath. He was vindicated by God, raised by the Spirit, so that he might once again pass through the heavens. But not for himself, but for his people, where he is seated at God's right hand on the promised Davidic throne where he might speak for, intercede for, plead his blood for every single one of you saints. Do you see the love the Son of God has for his sinful people? The answer is yes. You should say yes. Do you see it? We do not have a high priest who came from the dust, but one who has passed through the heavens for you, beloved. I want you to see the sheer glory of the God-man, our, our great high priest, Jesus. I, I, don't, I don't like driving past Lowe's on James Island. Like I, I, don't, I don't like passing the expressway, much less passing through the heavens in order to save people who hate me. Through his perfect work as our priest, he has changed and he has transformed us. He has made us new creatures through his work as our priest. And and the problem with the Old Testament priesthood was that it couldn't change the people. Couldn't change them. Couldn't make them new. It could not deliver That was intentional. The sacrifices didn't actually take away sin and give the people new hearts. You think about how many thousands and thousands and thousands of animals whose blood was spilt 
in order for Israel to not be crushed, and they still end up going into exile. Jesus, as our great high priest, however, does change his people. His sacrificial offering of his own body and blood does take away sin because it is the infinitely precious, transcendent, holy, incarnate Son of God who speaks and acts for us. Hold fast to the gospel, beloved, because the Son of God is our great high priest. But before we lean too much on the incarnate Son's transcendence and are, and are tempted to think that this kind of priest could, could never really speak for us or never really understand what it's like to be people like us, the author of Hebrews anticipates this argument by us by telling us that we must hold fast our confession not only because we have a transcendent priest Son who has passed through the heavens, but he's also a great high priest who's able to understand and sympathize with us in our weaknesses. Although he is the infinitely glorious Son of God, our high priest is also the humble and lowly incarnate Son of God who became like us in every way, who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. This divine Son, Jesus Christ, is able to empathize and sympathize with you. The word here is literally the Greek word that we get our English sympathize. But the word here means more than simply compassion. It's more than like, oh, wow, I, I'm so sorry that you're dealing with like really terrible situation. It's more than that. Jesus certainly has compassion for his people in that way, but the, but the author tells us here that the kind of compassion that the Son of God has for us as our high priest includes not only just like feeling for us, which is what the word means, feeling for us or feeling with us, but it also involves his active help. The compassion that Jesus has for us, beloved, moves him to act on our behalf. He's not complacent, he's not lazy, he's not unresponsive. Our great high priest took the initiative to come down to us in order to save us from our sins. We could not pass through the heavens and say, uh, hey, need somebody. Do you have a great high priest that we could use? No, he passed through the heavens. He was rejected. He was crushed intentionally, and then he passed back through the heavens and said, mission accomplished. I'm pleading my blood. Our great high priest took the initiative to undo the rebellious messes of sin and death that we created. And he did it by taking sin and death upon himself in our place. If you're in Christ, you, you will never experience, a, maybe your life feels really painful, but that's not wrath. That's the worst that eternity gets for you if you're in Christ. It may be the Lord's discipline, not necessarily for active sin on your part, but because He's molding you more into this and conforming you into the image of His Son. But like, that's not eternal, unending, inexplicably terrible wrath that, that the New Testament describes, but, but describes in ways that is simply limited. Like describing the new creation, the glories of heaven. Like, who can describe that with earthly metaphorical language? Who can describe that? No one. Take the best that we can, and yeah, it's like uh, gold. You know, gold's really nice, but something infinitely better than gold. Well, like, where the worm never dies and the fire never quenched, and weeping and gnashing of teeth, like, infinitely worse than that. That's what Jesus endured as our high priest and as our sacrifice.
Our great high priest took the initiative to come down and suffer unto death so that we might be saved and see our God on the last day. And it not be a, a, an experience of terror. Not an experience where we're like, mountains fall down on us and hide us from this God who is just and has come for retribution against us. For all of us saints here today, our great high priest came to save us thousands of years before we knew we had a problem. The Son of God, Jesus Christ, the incarnate Son, is able to represent us and advocate us before the throne because he was perfectly obedient and faithful in the assignment he had from God. Jesus was tempted in every respect as we have been, yet is without sin. We don't need a priest who has a fallen nature like us. We don't need a priest who sins and rebels just like we do. We got that taken care of. I don't, I don't need that. I'm good. I'm good. That, those were the Levites. They offered sacrifices for themselves first because they're of their own sin. And then they offered sacrifices on behalf of the people. But the sacrifices and the priestly work and intercession could not change Israel. And no Roman Catholic priest, Anglican priest, no priest in this world here today walking the earth can change and reconcile you to God. There's only one man, the Son of God. Why? Because he has no sin. He was appointed by God. He has no sin. He was perfectly faithful in the midst of temptations and tribulations. And he was qualified through his sufferings. He was perfected in his sufferings to serve as our great high priest. And, and this, is the, this is the great hope and great encouragement that we have. Jesus understands temptations to far greater depths than any of us will ever understand. Because when we're tempted, we fail. We don't endure. We fall in the midst of those temptations. And Jesus experienced temptation all the way to the end and was obedient. That's the kind of intercessor we need. I don't need a guy who's a bum like I am. I need a guy who understands my weakness and understands how much of a failure I am. And yet he wasn't. And that's who we have in Christ. Jesus took the worst and most difficult testing of anyone who has ever lived, and he didn't blink. Jesus didn't fall short in his sufferings. He suffered obediently for God's glory and for your redemption unto death. You can't, you can't suffer more than that. Death on a cross, all the way to the end. He was faithful. He understands hardship better than you will ever understand hardship. Like, isn't, isn't it like really good when, when you're going through something and you're like, well, this person over here is, man, they've experienced that and they're on the other, they, they're on the other side of it. Like Jesus is that for everything. Jesus is that like when you're experiencing hardship and suffering, you're not talking to someone who's like, I have no idea what that's like. You're talking to someone who has far outstripped the suffering and hardship that you're endure, you've endured. And whose who's suffering and hardship, they, he, he, never, he never deserved any of it. And, it, and yet he was faithful. He has endured more hardship and suffering than any of us could ever understand and certainly ever endure ourselves. And beloved, he is the man who least deserved it. In fact, he deserved immediate obedience from his creatures. 
immediate worship from his image bearers, immediate and total faithfulness from his disciples, immediate repentance and surrender from his enemies. And what he got was a lifetime of hardship, unbelief, suffering in first century Roman occupied Israel and a cross covered with his blood at the very end of it. That's what he got. But it was all intentional for us. Not once was he bitter or unholy. Not once was he unfaithful or a jerk. Do you know how many times his disciples disappointed him? And every had every right. Not once did he doubt God's good promises or run to sin because of his hardship. Not once did he disobey. As it was with these Hebrew Christians, it is often our sufferings that cause us to turn from Jesus into other things, including sin. The fiery furnace and the crushing crucible of God-ordained suffering often exposes in us the sin which so easily deceives us as well as the lesser things to which we will often run to escape our hardships. And Jesus never did any of it. He was perfectly obedient. The incarnate Son of God was tested with greater severity, lived and died under the incomprehensible weight and pressure of winning the salvation for all of His people. He died under the weight of all of our sins when each of us would be crushed by God's wrath for our own sins alone. And he bore all of the sins of his people. All of that was on his shoulders. He endured more terrible suffering than any of us could ever imagine. And he was perfectly obedient, faithful in the midst of it all. He has gone, he has passed through the heavens, and he's not saying, well, screw those guys. But he pleads his blood for us. That's who you have speaking for you, beloved. Let us hold fast our confession. Through his work, we've been shown mercy and have been forgiven by our God. Let us hold fast to our confession because we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, and because we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. When we see how much our great Savior has done to save us, how could we not hold fast our confession? When we see our Savior's faithfulness in His sufferings, how can we not ourselves hold fast for His glory in the midst of our own sufferings? When you look at the cross, what could be more valuable than the Jesus who bore it for you? Our great high priest, Jesus, the incarnate Son of God, has sprinkled His own blood on that heavenly mercy seat And has released God's mercy on all of his new covenant people. He offered his body and his blood so that God's judgment reserved for you and your sin might fall on him. And God's grace and favor reserved for him and his righteousness might fall on you. Because of his priestly work, everything that was credited to you, namely your rebellion and eternal wrath, was credited to him. And his righteousness and his standard and credit before the Lord has been imputed to you. You get that which you could never attain and that which you could never deserve. All by grace through the priestly work of Christ. As your sinless and perfect priest, he's able to effectually intercede for you. Like he intercedes for you not with like a... Father, it would be great if, like, you could, you could help, help him, if you could help her. I mean, I know that you've got a lot going on, and it might, you might not be able to do it. That's not his intercession. He pleads his blood. It's done. It is finished. His priestly intercession is effectual when he 
speaks, the Father hears and responds. So his intercession for you is perfectly effectual. Why? So that you're one to God and kept by God. As your perfect high priest, Jesus is both able and willing to save you and keep you. As your perfect high priest, Jesus' intercession for you is always accepted by the Father. As your perfect high priest, Jesus is able to perfectly sympathize with you and understand your sufferings, particularly your hardships in the midst of obedience and suffering for His namesake because He is the incarnate Son of God who is our high priest. He is able to bear with your weaknesses. He knows what it feels like to be exhausted. He knows what it's like to be hungry. He knows what it's like to be rejected by men. He knows what it's like to be betrayed. He knows what it's like to be forsaken by God. None of you Christians will ever experience that. He knows what it's like to be hated. He was tempted in every way, yet without sin. And he speaks for you. He's able to bear your weaknesses, not simply because he is the transcendent Son of God, but because he is the eminent, incarnate Son of God who's near to you. And he has walked the road of faith before you in perfect obedience and called you to take up your cross and follow him. And the good news is, is that while he is in heaven, he is always near to you because he has given you his spirit. We hold fast our confession, knowing that our sins are forgiven, knowing that we will hold fast in the faith, knowing that we've been cleansed from sin, not because we're great, not because we had a good week, not because we're sober this many days, not because we're a really good mom, not because we worked really hard this week, but because we have a great high priest who speaks for us and stands for us, who has passed through the heavens. Jesus is not ashamed to call you brothers and sisters. He's not ashamed to call losers like us, brothers and sisters, to call us family. He's not ashamed of you because your acceptance for, before God is not at all conditioned upon your performance, but it's based upon His. And He has sealed you as His own. The Son of God alone secures your redemption, and when I say secures, I mean keeps it forever. Not like secures it for a little bit and then you lose it. If you can lose your salvation, then Christ has not secured it. If you can lose your salvation, his priestly work and intercession or his sacrifice was somehow deficient. How we understand and interpret the warning passages in Hebrews, which we'll be tackling the weeks and months ahead, will depend greatly on how you see and understand the priestly work of the Son of God. How you understand the extent of the atonement, for whom did Christ die, will depend greatly on how you see and understand the priestly work of the Son of God. How you understand the nature, the makeup of the new covenant community, believers only, believers and their children, will depend greatly on how you see and understand the priestly work of the Son of God. If we are to hold fast our confession, we must hear the exhortation of the author that we hold fast because Jesus is our great and sympathetic high priest who acts on our behalf. And you strive to enter God's rest out of that promise. Jesus is my high priest, so I'm going to exhaust myself for the kingdom. Jesus is my high priest, so I'm going to put sin to death because he is, sin has been crucified with Christ. Beloved, hold fast our confession. Hold fast to the gospel. There is no other salvation, no other means of redemption upon, uh, other than the work of Christ Jesus who speaks and stands for you. If you are weak and you are weary in your faith, take heart because your great high priest continues to speak for you. And he won't ever stop. He's, he's interceding for you as much as on your best days as he is on your worsts. 
Your standing before the Lord is secured by Him. You've been clothed with with Christ and the righteousness that He won. His work continues to ground and secure your faith. Jesus has passed through the heavens to intercede for us. His priestly work is perfect and unblemished. And I'm just keep hammering this. Keep hammering it. Lord willing, I'll have six chapters of Hebrews to keep slapping each of you with the perfect priestly work of Christ. Enduring the faith because of the priestly work of Christ. Your sins are forgiven because the blood of Christ speaks for you. Why? Because we all forget it. We all forget it. And you know what? That forgetting is covered. And Jesus doesn't forget to intercede for you. We will hold fast because Jesus holds fast to us. So, hold fast. Jesus holds, fa- holds you fast, beloved, so you better hold fast. His blood holds us fast and it makes us new. He has gone before us into God's presence. He is preparing the way for us to enter into it ourselves. He is building for us a city. Since we know these glorious realities, let us believe them with hearts full of faith in God's good and faithful Son, our High Priest Jesus. May God help us to hold fast our confession because our priest Jesus has accomplished our redemption.